Okay, the second video on chapter 9 starts with uh, figure 9.1. I think figure 9.1 is quite important. Uh, it's on the question whether we want cash or in-kind transfers. So, uh, let's just break this graph up into parts so that we can understand it. Your first homework which is due on Thursday night, is also on this. So, um, let's say someone earns money. This is a regular budget constraint. So, you get, you, you have money and then you can either buy food or you can buy other goods um, or you can buy a combination of the two. And the rate at which you can change food into other goods is the slope of the curve, which I've, I've, read, I've done the two red short lines. That's a ratio of changing from one commodity to another. You can always buy less food and more other goods or less other goods and more food, but you can stay anywhere on the budget constraint. Now, let's say the government gives you food um, so that your that the your budget constraint just moves to the right. You can still only buy as many other goods as before. You can see that the maximum of other goods is still at the intercept of the vertical uh, original vertical uh, axis. The curve shifts to the right, meaning that the government gives you that amount from the origin to the right, up to the red dotted line, amount of food, or say food vouchers, uh, with which you can only buy food, but you cannot buy something else. So what will happen to your indifference curves? Um, you, will, you will obviously move to a higher, uh, a higher indifference curve if you move from the original line to that line marked with the red curly brackets. So now you can con you can consume anywhere on that portion of the line. You can consume more food and the same amount of um, other goods. But what about this blue dotted line? What does that mean? So the blue dotted line uh, would mean that the government uh, allows you to trade the food for other goods. So it's like giving you money rather than uh, giving you money rather than just food vouchers so that you can not only buy more food but that, that you can also buy more other goods. So that, that portion would mean that you can trade the food for other goods or in, uh, in other words, get money to be able to buy either food or other goods. And that's where we get to the uh, graph 9.1. Now, obviously, I3 and I2, if you extend them, I mean, you can very easily see the original I2 and I3 will cross each other, and that's not allowed. Because we're looking at one individual uh, one individual's indifference curves. So how should these indifference curves be drawn if I3 is supposed to lie higher than I2? You can either draw, you can draw an indifference curve in any which way you want. It would be possible to draw I3 higher than I2 or it would be possible to draw I2 higher than I3. So that's what the homework is all about. But the way that they have done it is wrong. So I'll come back to this, but hopefully after the homework you'll already understand that depending on the indifference, the forms of the indifference curves, in cash transfers could lead to higher utility than um, in-kind transfers and vice versa. So if you take the first semester test into consideration, uh, you should realize that um, this is a nice graph to ask for you um, to use in a, in a test question. 
but it's also very common. I've seen this question so often at UNISA and at the University of Pretoria in this course. So this is a, this is a very important question. Then 9.3.2 talks about conditional cash transfers. You just don't, you just have to know the, the definition and the basic idea of that. So it's about like livelihood protection, but also livelihood promotion. That's the two uh, goals of social security. So how can a conditional cash transfer program promote livelihood promotion? So the idea is to com combat current poverty, but also future poverty. So you get money and you don't just spend all the money, but you also invest some of the money to so that you are not poor in future as well. That's how it works. So the, the conditional transfers means that the government gives you something with conditions on it and, and the conditions are exactly written such that you will take care of yourself in the future and not only for today. So the Tanzania, the Read Box 9.1, it's, it's a nice story. So in Tanzania they have a, a, a conditional cash transfer program with three conditions. Just look at this. Three conditions. So if you are a child up to the age of five, you have to visit the health clinic. Well, the parent has to take the child to the clinic six times per year. If they don't do that, then they lose the grant. So the kids will stay healthy. Then children aged 7 to 15 to the right must be enrolled in school and they must have an attendance of 80%. Isn't that really nice? That's the second condition. And if, if you're an old person, you also have to visit the health clinic once a year. So that's a type of, of conditions. I will give you a grant, but if you have children, you have to take them to the clinic very regularly. If they are school-aged children, they have to attend school 80, at least 80% of the time. And if, the, if you are an old age person, you also have to go to the clinic soon. So can, uh, I mean often. So can you see how the conditions will, if they fulfill the conditions, the grant will not only uh, have a a benefit for now for this month but it will make sure that you go to school that you get an education that you eventually get a job that you're healthy and in the long run that you that you promote um, income okay so figure 9.2 is also very interesting and very important so let's start we had this graph uh, in the second year micro last year so we have a budget constraint and the uh, the horizontal curve shows hours per day hours of leisure per day from left to right so if you read the graph from right to left that's hours of work per day hours of work per day so at the very right end of the horizontal axis the person is not working and then the slope of the curve is the wage rate and the person can decide how many hours to work and the maximum income that the person can get is the intercept on the vertical axis on the left so let's say the government gives you a grant then this curve will shift up vertically so if you don't work then you, if you don't work, then you still get the grant. So that's the amount, that's the new intercept on the right hand side vertical axis is now the size of the grant. And then if you work at the, the current wage that you're working at, you can still earn more money. So if we would just draw in different curves in a very normal way, then, um, it would seem that the indifference curve would shift 
up and to the right for the new tangency point on the new budget constraint. But what does that mean? That means the person is working less because the, the higher indifference curve touches the budget constraint to the right of the original one. That means more leisure. So the income effect, that's an income effect. The person gets income, more income, and therefore pro, uh, consumes more of both goods. So more leisure and more other goods. So that might then mean that if a person gets a grant, they may decide to work less. That's some people's argument. So if we go to look at figure 9.1, then they have a third curve. So the first one is the movement from E0 to E1. E0 uh, is the original um, equilibrium point to E1 if there's a grant given. But then, what if the government taxes the income? If the government starts, if you get enough income and you, you go into the tax bracket, what then? And if the government then takes away from you, then the, the budget constraint slope is flatter, means the wage that you take home is less, then you will move to E2. So, and that's the substitution effect. So, the, the income effect will cause you to work less, but then if leisure becomes more expensive uh, and other goods, um, so if relatively more expensive than other goods, then you will also decide to work less. And that's the, the risk of the whole grant system and paying the grants by income taxes means that you can actually uh, let people want to work less than before. I think this argument falls a, uh, apart for unemployed persons because the unemployed person is at is at the right hand origin and if you just give an unemployed person a grant they will still move to the um, to they still move to the uh, vertical intercept and so there's there's no uh, indifference curve touching at that point uh, and one could very easily think that a person will still want to start working um, just to be better off so this argument of the incentive effect holds for people that have a job that already that are already working and if you give them a grant, then they may decide to, um, to work less. Okay, so when you read paragraph 9.5.1.2, then it's important just to, just to notice a few things. So the unemployment insurance fund, I just realized that I've that I've. Um, missed one of the pictures in the textbook. I'll start with that in the next uh, video. So the un Unemployment Insurance Fund, just look how big the fund was uh, four years ago, 160 billion. So that's a huge insurance fund and that, uh, uh, just notice that, that employees pay 1% of their earnings to, to uh, for unemployment insurance up to a maximum of a very very small amount of 124.78 uh, so that's a big number uh, and what i've said before is sadly the unemployment insurance fund is only for working people while many people in south africa are unemployed and they don't have access to this fund then uh, the con Compensation fund uh, is when someone gets injured on the job or so. There are different different funds, and the disability grants are grants for people who, who uh, other than road accidents and work-related accidents. So there are very various grants. You must have a basic idea what each one is and perhaps how big it is. I will start with that table that I've missed after this. <coughs> 